Well, to conclude our final segment before we break for dinner, uh, it's my honor. Uh, we have an amazing panel. I, I've become very good friends with uh, our moderator, uh, and I'm super excited that she was able to uh, fly here from New York to just do this for us tonight. I know everyone knows Deborah Norville. She's an iconic journalist and has been anchoring Inside Edition for many decades, and uh, she's just an amazing person, and I'm honored to have her here. And Deborah, if you could come out. Wow. Um, Vince Roberts was unbelievable, and what a really cool thing that was to get this look back since, you know, this event tonight is all about the future of television, but get this wonderful look back at the beginnings of television. But our topic is the future of television, and if that's not a lofty topic to assign a group of people, I don't know what is. But the good news is we have a panel assembled of industry experts who are truly qualified to talk about the future of television because they are living it today. They are industry leaders who are embracing the technology right now that's going to be a part of television going forward. So let me um, begin introducing our panel. First up is Shri Kote. Shri is Chief Architect, uh, Software Architect for Comcast. His title there is Executive Vice President for Technology Design and Development. This guy is the daddy of the X1 among other things. He's responsible for engineering and operations of consumer products, including next generation applications and software, video platforms, mobile development, and anything that faces the consumer. This man knows all about it. We're delighted to have you. Thank you, thank you, glad to be here. With us from Microsoft is Bob DeHaven. Bob is general manager for worldwide communication and media. He's the guy with the crystal ball because Bob's job, among many other tasks that he has, is identifying trends and opportunities in the communications and media sector and looking for strategic involvements. Among other things, he's had a number of, of um, positions at the Microsoft um, company where he's been for many, many years. Most recently, he was leading sales, marketing, and business business operations in the United States for the communications and media sector, Bob DeHaven. And rounding out our panel from DirecTV is Gunter Kempner. He is the Vice President of Broadcast Operations and Engineering for Latin America. He leads all of DirecTV's Latin American operations, both here in the United States and in virtually every country except two, and we're not going to name them because, you know, poo on them. Um, there are now 39 million subscribers at DirecTV, and this man is responsible for the program and getting to a good chunk of them. Uh, among the responsibilities he has is implementation of initiatives, integrating various countries together, and making it all flow seamlessly so that customer always wants to have DirecTV. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel looking at the future of television. I loved on the, uh, uh, the segue between one of the speakers a moment ago, they played the Urgent song, which hopefully Foreigner is going to be playing um, tonight when the concert gets up here. But that's a great song to have sort of leading into this panel because the pace of everything today in technology is, is unflagging and really demanding. Let me just ask each of you, we'll start with you, Shri, and go down the line. How is the pace of change today impacting what you do at Comcast, ABC, Disney, et cetera? Uh, well, you know, in, in terms of urgency, we're going through this really big transition from uh, being a company that's about packaging and pricing to being one that's about products and services. And, um, you know, to enact the kind of transition that we, that we need, we have to start to build consumer services and consumer experiences that people love. Um, and we have a bunch of proof points now in the marketplace with things like X1 about the kind of impact that can have not only the top line, but on consumer sentiment. And so in terms of urgency, I would say, you know, fully realizing that vision across our, our entire product line, you know, up to including not just the technology stack, but our business policy is probably the most urgent thing we have to do. Is that because the consumer is so twitchy right now? I, I think it's because they're looking for value. Um, and it used to be that value was just the bundling, right? It was just the fact that you got all these channels and it was the only way to get all these channels. Um, and it was kind of a price club, right? It was a sort of a ni nice value proposition. And I think consumers expect a lot more um, and quite frankly, if the products and services aren't differentiated, they can get it from a lot of different places. Bob? 
it's, uh, it's all about fail fast for us. We're just keeping up with that pace of change, uh, having to build out data centers and redesign data centers, redesign how we think about data centers. We're spending four and a half billion dollars a year just trying to keep up with the pace. So it's a, it's a dramatic impact. And we have to transform the company from one style of business completely to another, just like this industry is, mm -hmm. while we're flying the airplane. Gunter? With Urgent for DirecTV, uh, getting the best product for the, uh, for the, for the customer. I mean, in reacting, uh, understanding that you've got barriers to entry that are, that are coming down. You've got uh, uh, the, uh, the, we have to react, but, uh, but we have to actually anticipate what the customer really actually wants. Um, we take the World Cup uh, four years ago. It was driving our subscriber base uh, by 500,000 subscribers at a, uh, at, at a clip. This time around, it's shifting towards fewer subscribers each time, but, uh, but now our viewers are actually shifting to an internet over-the-top solution. We had a million uh, downloads of our, uh, our FIFA World Cup app. It's being able to provide that, uh, that change, agile adjustments to, uh, to meet what our customers are actually looking for, where they want their, uh, their content coming from. It'll be from the, uh, from the big screen, small screen, TV everywhere. You know what's amazing? If every one of your answers wasn't about technology. It was about the end user. And you know, each of you are really kind of the last mile um, to that consumer. Sunder Redstone is, is credited with saying content is king, but I know Charlie likes to say these days the customer is, you know, the prince, the emperor, he's, he's up there as a royalty as well. The role of the customer in driving these imperatives in your businesses, Bob, how is it impacting what you do at, at Microsoft? Well, what it's doing is it's creating massive disintermediation. Just about everybody can create a studio, create content, and drop it into the market. And, and everybody wants to do that now. And so the cloud and our shift to the cloud is, is sort of enabling that. Um, uh, and I think that's the biggest change. This industry is going through massive transformation and it requires cloud, ty cloud type technology and agility just to, just to stay above board. Yeah, but, but you know, how many cat videos? Do we, do we really need to see? <laughs> Which is why content holds the world captive. Whoever owns the content will be the king. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think the, the other big shift is, uh, you know, Gunther mentioned it already, but um, you know, being responsive to consumers and sort of being responsive to the competitive threat. Um, and I think that's one of the big things we see enabled by a, a new development model, right? For a modern technology company, speed versus quality is a fallacy. Um, and in fact, speed is a way to achieve quality. You know, making things more incremental, delivering changes more often. Um, it's actually less disruptive for users as well. And it's sort of a, a big shift that we're, that we're trying to embrace. Isn't that something different about the audience today that once upon a time they, they, they liked their product, they liked, they knew how to use it. Nowadays, they're much more easily, they are twitchy. They're, yeah. they're quicker to adopt new things. Yeah. But, but that's what I mean about incrementalism, not just on the quality front, but even on the consumer experience front. You know, if you change everything, then they get really annoyed, and you can understand why. They want to come in and watch their TV or use their service or whatever. But if you change things incrementally, then it's, you know, oh, well, this thing got better, and this minor thing got moved, and this thing was improved, and um, it's just easier for them to, to, to adopt to. How is the multi-screen world uh, changing your world? Uh, there's a statistic that I find kind of staggering that between 2013 and 2014, uh, use of mobile screen, the desire to use mobile screens increased 133%, and I don't know what the number would be from, from 2014 to 2015, but it's got to be huge. How much is mobile impacting what, what you deal with? Deborah, just to give you a, a quick example, with the last Olympics broadcast, we saw the amount of, of, uh, of household viewership drive up by almost 30% if the carrier or the, the provider offered multiple devices. And that's 30% on their expensive advertising dollars that they're, that, they're, that they're garnering for their television content. So if you have multiple devices, you're getting more eyeballs on your high branded advertising. Up, upwards of 30% for four, four uh, different different devices. So you think about how that's going to change the world, your ability to create that content and then serve that up on any device at any time is critical to success. Yeah, I think in the industry, we first thought that the, that the mobile device was actually going to detract. It was going to steal eyes from the, uh, from the big screen, from the, from the large TV. 
uh, we're finding that it, uh, that it actually potentially could uh, add, uh, add additional uh, viewers. I had my taxi driver in, uh, in, uh, in Argentina. Instead of his GPS mounted to the dashboard, he put his, uh, his, his mobile devices, was watching a soccer match. It was terrifying, I almost died. <laughs> but uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, he's, that's adding viewership. We monetize that, get an ad in there as well, and that's a, it's a real, uh, a real driver. But I think that's, that's a great point. I mean, I think the right way to think about it is, is multi-screen, you know what I mean? And in fact, we even talk about your mobile device really in a lot of ways is the first screen, right? Because that's the one you always have with you. It's the one that's sort of always on and, and you're connected to. Um, and certainly, um, certainly it's important to provide services for every single screen in, in your life. In fact, that's, you know, as if, you're, if you're a new X1 subscriber, we say, hey, TV used to be this thing you hung on the wall. Now it's a service for every screen in your life. Um, and that's vital. But I would uh, also punctuate that that's not a reason not to innovate on the big screen. Um, and one of the things we, we were talking about earlier in terms of, in terms of this being accretive is we, uh, we, did a, we did an interesting experiment with the Olympics last year. So on X1, the, uh, X1 was the only place that you could get not only all the broadcast content, but all of the digital content that was available online as well. So all on one screen. Um, you know, it was a, that was an option for everyone. We just happened to be one of the few that executed on it. Um, and what we saw was exactly that, a massive lift. Not only a 15 to 20 percent lift in uh, primetime viewing for households that engage with the digital extra content, so they went from something like 45 minutes to nearly an hour of primetime viewing, but they also watched an additional hour of digital extra content, so nearly doubling the amount of Olympics content they consumed. We got to give credit to Vince backstage. He made a great comment, a, a, a biz school comment that says it's all about culture because culture eats operations for lunch. So. Uh, <laughs> Culture eats change uh, management. Yeah. And, and change management for lunch. But, but, I, but I think that's part of the big cultural shift, right, is it's moving from thinking about technology and products as a service organization into being a leadership organization inside your company. And that's, that's a big deal. Even, even for the people who are product and technology people, they're sort of used to being in this role mm -hmm. of, of, you know, taking orders, not, not in, inventing yeah. the future, right? Mm -hmm. The, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the human operational element of, uh, of, of, a, of a transition to a virtualized environment uh, is a challenge. I mean, that we found. I've, I've got five broadcast centers, and, uh, and it's, it, it's, it's difficult to bring along the, the skill sets, uh, but we'll do it. It, uh, it happens. We're building out hybrid infrastructures initially, and then in, uh, in other areas where we've got the skill set, where we can leverage a centralized support team, we're, uh, we're actually going completely, uh, completely IP. But, uh, but we're finding... It's, it's shifting the jobs, it's shifting uh, the, the, the investment from, from capital to, to OPEX. It's, it's creating incredible specialization. I'm not sure it's actually creating uh, huge cost efficiencies just yet. It's clearly in uh, infrastructure and, uh, and, 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 and uh, expensive build outs, but, uh, but we're paying a lot more in needing more engineers, more higher skilled, specialized uh, software engineers in order to be able to, to maintain that level of uh, Five nines of, uh, of reliability that we might have enjoyed with uh, with baseband engineers. Reality is we can't keep our head in the sand. We're going to move to uh, to to IP. We're going to go to virtualization uh, no matter what. We just need to do it in a paced st strategy, which uh, as you can imagine has uh, has mapped out quite nicely in uh, when, in Steve's presentation. But it also gives you the opportunity, does it not, to um, as you were saying, Renu, the, the idea that you can launch a, pro a program, you can have scandal airing at the same time in every country. Um, the, the ability to control your programming and that kind of nimbleness isn't necessarily a cost saving, but it is a value added. Yeah, I think in terms of value add, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think what we're finding over and over again, and uh, you know, we've, we've long since crossed this threshold, but, but when we actually launched X1, mm -hmm. um, it was, because we were placing 20 years of, of, of 50 years of investment um, you know, in, in, in a couple of years, it was by every measure of quality a worse product. So call-in rates were higher, truck rolls were higher, you know, there, were, there were service impacts, um, and yet we'd go talk to customers and say, oh, well, do you want to give us back the old box? And they go, no, no, I just want you to fix it. <laughs> um, and I think the point there is when you deliver value and you build products that people love, they forgive you a lot. Exactly. Leave the build out to us and companies like us, and you guys focus on content. Right? Was, was that a sales pitch that I just heard? I couldn't resist. <laughs> what about security? You know, the idea of moving to, to the cloud, we've all read the headlines, we've all seen the stories. Um, the, the idea that by, by handing part of your operation to a set of servers that you may or may not retain absolute control over is a fearsome proposition, understandably. 
the question of security. So, I mean, obviously it's something we, we, we talk about a lot, and, and I, you know, the elephant in the room whenever you talk about security these days, obviously, is, is Sony. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think anyone, anyone here or, or out there would assert that what happened to Sony couldn't, couldn't happen to us. Um, and it's, you know, it's very likely that a version of that will happen, and in fact may have already happened. Um, and so when we think about security, there's sort of three, um, three things that we look for. Um, you know, one is um, you know, diversity of infrastructure. Um, it turns out, you know, not having a single choke point and having a little bit of diversity in your infrastructure um, you know, allows you to, to have resiliency around the security domain. Um, a second big point is around simplicity of policy. Turns out that the, you know, the biggest hacks are still social hacks, and to the extent that you can really kind of simplify your policy so you can manage and audit it uh, well um, is, is really, really critical. Um, and the third one is investing in security. Um, and on all three axes, we think public cloud is actually a, a good bet. Really? You know, just to sort of expand on that, Sony in particular, uh, um, when they were cracked, they were cracked on their private network. Um, they just re-upped for enterprise cloud for 72,000 users in the Eastern Hemisphere on the cloud, entirely on the cloud. And then they'll move the rest of the, of the Western Hemisphere over in FY16 onto the cloud. So, and, and it was because of the error, of because right. they wanted to put the and faith in the full-time cloud manager that does all the licensing, security. That, yeah. And, and that's, that's exactly it, right? I mean, the analogy is, you know, if you think about security is, you know, we all have rent-a-cops, you know what I mean? And that's fine when you're dealing with sort of the neighborhood thugs, uh, but when uh, North Korea comes calling, literally, <laughs> you, you, you don't want Paul Blart, right? You want the Marines. Are there any limitations to IP moving in that direction? What's, what's not likely to move to an IP-based system? Do you want me just to lay that out first? Uh, the financial services industry is hesitant to go there, obviously. There's a, there are private clouds, hybrid clouds, and public clouds. And I think there's a natural maturation process where people are going to start private, go to hybrid, and then eventually have the trust in the public cloud. But I'll let the content owners Give you Gunter, more what do you think on that? Yeah, the, for, again, back to, to the security concerns, I think that's, uh, that's one of our main issues. I mean, we would prefer, everybody thinks that their own security team is actually going to be, uh, going to be stronger, is uh, you want to keep it in-house and, uh, and know that, uh, that somebody else is looking out for your, for your interest. I've been to data centers all throughout the world, and there's some suspect uh, security policies that are out there. But the real benefits, I think, are going to come from the fact that, uh, that they can be leveraged on a large scale. When you've got 10 other uh, uh, large manufacturers, uh, large uh, uh, program providers actually leveraging that, uh, being able to, to uh, uh, invest so much more uh, to, on, on security, the, uh, we actually get the benefit uh, as a whole that uh, we couldn't afford on ourselves, by ourselves. Wow. No. Um. I want to follow up on something that, that we talked about backstage, and you had said, Gunter, that not all of your operations make sense to have on the IP because you aren't be, always yeah. able to, knowing that you operate in a number of foreign countries, you're not always able to find the caliber of individual who has the software skills, the engineering skills, mm -hmm. to do some of those operations that might make more sense to uh, migrate to the cloud here in this country. Yeah, I think I was, I was referencing before that uh, that's, we try to maintain a balance of, of operations uh, between the U.S. and Latin America. I mean, salaries are lower. I mean, uh, the actual cost of, of operation in, uh, in Latin America is actually uh, cheaper. So the, the desire to actually go to, uh, to an IP in infrastructure sometimes isn't there, uh, OPEX-wise. Um, I mean, the skill sets are there, the staff are there, but we're going to bring them on more slowly uh, and, uh, and, and at the same time pull certain uh, virtualized aspects of, of support uh, and, uh, and, and, and daily operations back to the, to the U.S. or, dare you say, to India or, or someplace where we can centralize the, uh, the, the operations and, uh, and take advantage of, uh, of real economies there. What about play out? Are you doing play out via IP? We will do play out IP uh, in the U.S. We're going completely IP. Uh, in Latin America, we're going to go, uh, we're going to go hybrid. Uh, on the production side, we're going to have to maintain islands in the, in the baseband world for, uh, for a significant amount of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have the challenges in Latin America of standards conversion. Uh, the, the unique challenges regulatory-wise between each country make it difficult to standardize uh, 
Uh, but again, some of the products that, that would allow us to, to, to convert and have an island of, 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 of IP operation in order to, uh, uh, to, to ab obtain the simplicity of fewer cables, fewer, less hardware, less power and cooling requirements uh, that, that are really uh, uh, giving us the, the real benefits. But, but doesn't that feel like point in time? I mean, it feels like if you looked out 30 years, for sure it's going to be, and it's just, you know, between now and then, when does it happen? Or do you feel like that's an end state? Well, it's going to be driven by our obsolescence cycle. I mean, right. Uh, right. Uh, we at DirecTV right now are in a massive growth phase in Latin America. We've launched two satellites, one in October, another one coming in December. We're going to be launching two, three hundred channels uh, in HD. And, uh, and it's uh, uh, time for us to do so. But, uh, but are we 100% uh, comfortable that, uh, that a fully IP environment in Latin America, where still I have channels being delivered in analog? I have the vast majority of channels still in, the, in, in SD. It's, uh, it's got to be timed. In the US, I'll go for completely uh, IP. Uh, we'll go on a staggered phase. Is it probably, probably four or five years for us uh, before that infrastructure is, uh, is as old and has to be replaced? So I'm feeling fairly comfortable yeah, that I'll have a, uh, think, yeah, a reliable think, yeah. IP infrastructure in, a, in the next generation around. Right. Or we have it completely in the cloud by then. You know, one of the, one of the promises of, of, of the IP cloud delivering programming is that it makes a content provider much more nimble in terms of the kind of device that that program is going to be viewed on. Uh, because you can build into the software um, the parameters needed to do that. Bob, you guys have a little experience with that at Microsoft. Well, again, our, 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 our expertise or our, our specialty is being able to provide any content to any device, whether it be on the Microsoft family or it be Apple or it be Android, any environment and getting it to, to uh, render properly. That's, that's the extent that, that we address the market. I think the content providers are, are looking to sort of layer on top of our, of our networks to be able to distribute that more efficiently to go after that market in, at, a, at an even faster pace. Have you guys calculated, and I'm not going to ask you to share any numbers, but feel free to if you want, <laughs> um, what it's going to do in terms of, as, as you guys migrate to this um, new technology that we've just um, heard the announcement about, how much more quickly you'll be able to bring programming to market, launch channels, that sort of thing, uh, by a factor of X. Do you know how much faster you anticipate it's going to be? Deborah, a, a good example, this is a live sports example, but with the Olympics, we were broadcasting that to I think six broadcasters, or excuse me, 22 broadcasters over six continents. And we were spinning up a channel, and there were, I think there were 200 channels that we spun up for the, for the length of the Olympics, the 18 days of, of uh, the Olympics. And it took us about 15 to 20 minutes to spin up a new channel. Wow. Every time. So that just gives you an idea of the scale and the pace of change. That's fast. If, if IP is one buzzword you heard when you, you got here to NAB, the other one was 4K. Anybody want to comment? You guys have been the first to yeah. be Direct broadcasting TV, I mean, in is, any is, form uh, in 4K. On the U.S. side, we're the, we're the first to actually offer uh, uh, 4K through, uh, through VOD uh, in conjunction with, uh, with the Samsung uh, TV. Uh, we'll be coming uh, out clearly at some point in the, in the very near future with uh, with a number of, of linear 4K uh, channels as well. Now, uh, again, the, the, we feel bullish that uh, that it uh, that it's coming. Uh, there are still questions, obviously, out there as as to uh, as to the technology. Uh, are we confusing the customer with changing uh, formats with uh, with HDR with full color gamut? The customer doesn't understand what these things are. I think the only ones right now who are, who are making uh, or likely to make real money on 4K right now are the TV uh, manufacturers. Uh, is this uh, one example where the customers aren't asking for it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's how, when we look at sort of the consumer response, you know, the, the way we think about it, 4K is wah wah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is coming and we'll see the technology evolve in that direction, but it's, you know, a really good 1080p signal at natural viewing distances. It's, it's kind of hard to tell the difference. I think we're, Probably more excited about HDR and HEVC and some some other things. Um, you know, we, we also have a, a, an application for the Samsung TV for 4K. We're delivering 4K content, and if there's consumer demand, we're, we'll certainly be there, like like I think everyone else. But um, it's not clear that there's there's real value to the consumer. Last year, the buzzword was um, programmatic. Everything was going to be programmatic. Ads were going to be programmatic. People were going to make bazillions of dollars. Um, 12 months later, anybody want to comment? 
Tree of Idiom? Yeah, the, I mean, uh, in you, terms had, of you, were, you were talking about the, yeah. bringing up the tail, uh, that, uh, that I think this is, uh, it, it's, it's not going to have a major impact, I think, on, on our primary content, but, uh, but for us, where you've got uh, uh, many, many channels, and, uh, and, and, and how do we actually uh, effectively schedule all those avails uh, and, uh, and, and, and in a in a cost-effective manner yeah. right now for all those locals. I mean, right now, the, the programmatic, programmatic is going to actually allow us, I think, to, to, to bring up uh, the, uh, what we call, again, the tail of, uh, of our uh, ad revenue a little bit. Uh, I mean, you were saying what, what it, percentage increase? No, no I, I think that's right. I mean, I think we see exactly that happening. And this is a transition the online world went through 15 years ago, right? And, and you know, what, what we see is um, that it doesn't so much change the head, meaning what you're charging for premium advertising. I mean, there's a reason that even Google employs hundreds of, of advertising salespeople because it really is about you know, premium content and the sales cycle and relationships, but it can materially lift, um, lift the tail. Um, and you can really do remnant, remnant inventory optimization. And uh, you know, we've seen anywhere between two and five X um, in, terms of, in terms of the kind of lift that it can provide for the area under the curve. So not so much you know, what you're charging for your premium advertising, but it really helping lift um, the advertising at the end. Um, and you know, I, th I think Gunter's point is exactly right. You know, as we're having more proliferation of content and endpoints and screens and services, um, the, the old model of selling advertising just isn't effective. Um, what is the new model then? I, I think the new model does become programmatic for the tail. Um, and I think the head stays the way it is, but I think it does, and, you know, a, a very, very good proof point example of this is, um, you know, we have our TVE application. Um, and it's, you know, it's one of the highest rated uh, OTT applications in the, in the Apple App Store. Um, and uh, the number one complaint actually is around the advertising, that it's repetitive and you know, that people keep seeing the same ads over and over again because we just haven't, as you start to fragment and get to the long tail, we just don't have an effective sales cycle. And I think that's where programmatic has its, uh, has its opportunity and upside. But aren't those incremental dollars, I mean, to be honest? Well, that's the question. Are we gonna grow the advertising pie or is this all managing share shift, right? Um, and you know, candidly, with the big data that's also going on out there, you're able to see what content it has a longer tail. I'm a big college football fan, and anybody that follows Alabama football, not, not my school of choice, I'm a horned frog, but uh, um, they watch their games over and over and over, and you can embed content or embed additional advertising, programmatic advertising in certain points of that game with that audience over and over, and you can monetize that for a significant length of time, a lot longer than just the live broadcast. So I want to follow up on that. I'd like to hear from all of you about the role that the internet and mobile can play in, in those kinds of things, in consumer consumption, whether it's video streaming or just in time broadcasting or time delay or that sort of stuff, how is, is this new wave of technology going to impact consumer consumption in, in those ways? The, for me, again, the, again, the reality is the multi screens, you are, there's certain content, again, it all comes down to content. People don't care how they're going to get their content. They don't, uh, we've done an exercise. Uh, people don't even acknowledge that, uh, that DirecTV or, uh, or, or Comcast, how you get your content. They only care about the content, the program itself. And then it comes down to the program. If it's old, if it's, if it's, not, if it's not a sports event that's going on exactly right now, if it's not the first play of a, uh, uh, of, a, of a great show coming from, uh, from any one of, uh, of, of, of the, the networks, it's not efficient to actually download it uh, through, the, through the internet. I mean, there's certain content that is ideal for, for a push through the satellite, through your, uh, your cable company. It's that live content. It's that, but the vast majority of our networks, the vast majority of the content that is out there is, is, is filler, it's replay. It's, uh, it's filling up those third, fourth, fifth networks that, uh, that we're forced to, to carry. Um, that's the content that should actually be uh, pulled most efficiently, and it's going to be that hybrid. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and again, we in the industry all have to acknowledge that and basically find mechanisms to make that as, uh, as seamless and as user-friendly user that, uh, that they're agnostic and they really don't, uh, don't care where they're getting the conference, whether it's Netflix, Hulu, Comcast, DirecTV, or whatever. The, the other thing that we think about is it creates a, a shifting role for the aggregator. I mean, consumers are going to have a lot more choice. They're going to have a lot more content. There's going to be definitely more fragmentation in terms of sort of brand affinity around, around, um, around media. Um, but the interesting thing is, and we think we've seen this over and over again, as consumers have more choice, 
they actually value aggregators even more. Yeah. This is why Google works, this is why eBay works, and Amazon, and, and to some extent why, why Hulu's so successful, is because it aggregates all that content that um, otherwise is, is disparate. And it actually becomes less important how it looks as long as you can get it when you want it. Right? I think that's right. I, I think it is all about, it's all about convenience. And convenience actually trumps both quality and, and in, quite frankly, price, in that people are willing to pay for convenience. And I think that's what you're seeing in terms of the shift. And, and Gunther's touched on it a couple of times, but if you look at live uh, broadcasting, ratings have never been higher for live broadcasts, right? The, you know, the Super Bowl, the Oscars, the Olympics, uh, people, people still care about all that content. It's just that the behavior is shifting because they value convenience. Content is king, but the user is the prince. Exactly, exactly. Last thought from each of you. Um, the future of television. What's the one thing that you want people to take away? I'm going to start with you, Gunter, and we'll bring it back this way. The, that's, the industry is changing so rapidly that, uh, that uh, we as the industry need to be as agile as possible. Uh, we need to uh, move to virtualization. We need to, to, to uh, find more efficient ways, but not losing sight of what the, what the customer is looking for. They're looking for a balance of convenience. Uh, millennials want content uh, that, uh, that's, that's, that's available, that's free. They hopefully think eventually they'll grow up and they'll actually uh, figure a way that they'll realize that they have to pay for it as well. But, uh, but uh, again, I think it comes down to riding this, uh, this, uh, this, this rapidly uh, changing time uh, that we're in right now, uh, being agile and being able to respond uh, to, uh, to, to those, uh, those new disruptors that are out there, and, uh, but focus on the customer and focus on, uh, on the content as the, the number one reason why people are watching television. Bob DeHaven. Uh, I would say... Uh, the excitement at the pace of change. I, the, the, the rapid adoption of the, of the cloud has shocked all of us. I think we've all been surprised at how quickly people have let go of their own, you know, sort of old proprietary systems and jumped in the, into the cloud. So it's an exciting time, but it's also a risky time. So agility and the ability to fail fast have got to be core competencies in everybody's operation going forward. And I would just say that's the biggest thing that, that, we, that we take away. So, you know, we were, we were talking a little bit about, uh, obviously, the panel of the future of TV, and we were talking a little bit about the word television uh, backstage. Um, and, I, and I, you know, one of my sort of jokes on this is, hey, if you're watching TV on not a TV, you're still, you're still watching TV. Um, but I think there is something to that notion in that we're still a, a little bit elitist in how we think about digital entertainment. Um, and I think one of the things you'll see with the future of TV is um, that we'll, we need to start embracing all forms of digital entertainment as, as first class citizens. You know, YouTube and Crackle and Pandora and Spotify and gaming and you know, all, all these other art forms. Well, whatever form it comes in, it will be media that consumers gravitate toward that producers and content providers make available and uh, that will employ, we hope, a lot of people <laughs> for a lot of time to come. I want to thank our panel very much um, for you, being here. I want to thank all of you.